Chapter 31. A Wedding Song? On that gray, troubled evening, a substantial breeze blew across the top of Rainbow Hill, and without the sunshine, everyone felt a little chilled. Zaheer walked into the house and brought down a stack of blankets. Several tinies were thankful to rot themselves up as Zaheer talked a warm comforter around Uncle Louie. Once again, the dark-haired patient took a seat close beside the older man in the swing. Amy continued to massage the aging tiny's shoulders, sensing it was helping him to relax. For a few minutes, everyone sat in silence, recovering from Damien's emotional outburst. Since the fire and the accident almost three weeks ago, which had changed so much in paradise, some, like Charlie, Nancy, and Milan, had not had much interaction with Uncle Louis. After the heated argument, they weren't in the mood for fun on the hill. There are no rainbows today, Santa said sadly, looking over at the sun catcher. I have been enjoying them in the caring center, Uncle Louie remarked. They are usually the best around mid-afternoon. Glancing around the group, Uncle Louie asked, So what else has been happening in paradise? I feel so out of touch. Has everything been okay at the store? He asked Nancy. Yes, she smiled. Milan has taken over your room just to keep everything safe at night. Good decision, Milan, Uncle Louie nodded. We're learning how to best shear the sheep, Fahid spoke up. He laughed. It sure will be a lot easier if Kenzie is there to help us the next time. Tina giggled. Yes, Charlie and Fahid had to sit on the sheep's legs while I cut off the wool. For a while, Uncle Louie talked to the farmers about their new woolen products, and then Georgia spoke up. I'm going to make a new book, she said excitedly. Damien asked me to do one about his surfing shows. Uncle Louie nodded quietly. Not the fire? Oh, no, she shuddered. That was far too scary. I don't want to remember anything about it. Kenzie piped up. Maybe Vanitha will do a book on the fire. All those heroic actions shouldn't be forgotten. George and Kenzie exchanged resentful looks. After some whispering in the corner, Ponzi announced, Lily and I are getting married. That's exciting news. Throwing her arms around Ponzi, Lily nodded. As soon as Dia makes my dress, she exclaimed. I might have it done by next week, Dia promised. Nancy came over to Milan and raised his hand in the air. We're getting married too, she said proudly. Milan smiled up at her. Dia will be busy, he said. I've already started your dress, the gifted seamstress promised Nancy, since you traded the beautiful red gem. Thank you, Nancy smiled. Lily rolled her eyes. She had only traded five tickets to the fun forest, which hardly compared. She knew she wouldn't have priority. I'll do your hair, girls, Georgia offered. That would be lovely, Nancy said. Yuan spoke up quietly. And Vanitha and I will make each a flower bouquet. The girls clapped eagerly. Just remember, everyone, Uncle Louie pleaded, Making a promise to love someone for the rest of your life won't always be easy. This is a commitment to look after each other and think of your partner first through good times and bad. Of course, Ponzi smiled. Lily always puts me first. Knowing Ponzi was joking, Uncle Louie chuckled. Turning to Amy, Lily pleaded, Will you and here sing a song for us? A wedding song? Swallowing hard, Amy glanced briefly over at Zaheer. She felt this might be an awkward, emotionally disconcerting task. Zaheer looked alarmed. He frowned and, and then he shrugged. We can try, he said. I'll play the music, George offered. She looked up at Zaheer. We've already made a lot of beautiful melodies. They only need some words. Zaheer nodded. He didn't look enthused. Make it a good song, Nancy smiled. I want you to sing at our wedding, too. Lima and Santa had been deliberating in the corner with plenty of giggles and laughter. Suddenly, they boasted up, and Santa clapped her hands with excitement. And we're going to get married, too, she cheered. And then she broke out into a happy dance. 
Lima clapped along and spontaneously began to sing. Santa chimed in. Everyone looked at each other with amazement. It was the beginnings of a beautiful song, and the words were very fitting for a wedding. Amy laughed. I think Santa and Lima should do the songs. Two songs will be fantastic, Ponzi smiled. You can both do songs. But my nurse, the lady in white, has to sing at our wedding, and she sings best for Sahir. Kenzie smiled. Hey, the heed, he called out. Let's bring the xylophone up. Then Sahir can practice. Without hesitation, the two ran off toward the store. Sensing they might need help, Charlie ran after them. While the others filled Uncle Louie in on their daily lives, answering questions about mango production, the bats, the bees, the honey supply, and many other practical matters, the xylophone was hoisted up the hill and positioned under the veranda of the caring center. Damien and Vanitha rejoined the group hand in hand. The tall blonde surfer seemed to have calmed down. Everyone turned to Sahir in eager anticipation, hoping to hear some beautiful music. Thanking Kenzie and Charlie, the dark-haired man with the deep purple scars stood up from the swing, left his new medallions on the table, and headed over to the instrument. With some hesitation, he picked up the mallets and tried out a few tunes. However, his right arm was stiff, the music was flat, and it lacked his usual flair. Discouraged, he put down the sticks. I'm just not feeling it right now, he apologized heavily. Turning the Ponzi, he said, Santa and Lima sing really well. Georgia picked up the mallets and began playing the songs which she had helped create. Come on, see here, she encouraged. What about this one? It sounds beautiful, Damien called out. You're the best at this, Gorgio. Looking down, Zaheer didn't respond as he made his way back to the bench swing. Or maybe this, the pretty blonde girl said, trying something else. But she just couldn't inspire the musician. Amy wasn't in the right mood either. As the deflated musician sat back down on the swinging bench close by, there were no melodies welling up inside her heart. Just anxious, jealous thoughts. She couldn't imagine singing a wedding song with Sahir about love and special relationships if Georgia was included. Trying one more tune, the beautiful blonde looked up with exasperation. What's wrong with you? She rebuked Sahir. These are so pretty. You liked them before. You only have to think of some words. How hard is that? When Zaheer didn't answer, Georgia tossed the mallets aside and burst out, You aren't the same anymore. In fact, you are so different. I don't even know who you are. Amy swallowed hard. She wasn't sure where to look. Kenzie spoke up. That's not fair, Georgia, he protested. Zaheer is the same good man he's always been. A few scars don't change who someone is. Well, I've had enough of this, Georgia retorted angrily, running off to the stone stairway. Time to go, Cart, Damien called out with an amused smile as he looked around at all the bewildered tinies. We can get in a few runs if we go right now. With the blonde surfer heading to the stairs, most of the tinies followed. They had enjoyed their chat with Uncle Louis. They were dismayed by all the drama. And a fun escape was now compelling. Sahir so walked off into the forest and Kenzie ran after him. Bewildered, Amy took a seat on the swing and was thankful that Uncle Louie patted her hand. All in all, that was a rather rough evening, Uncle Louie murmured. Laying her head on his shoulder, Amy agreed. And to think it all started with an award ceremony, he sighed. Chapter 32. A Willing Sacrifice After spending a long hour apart, the group of five regathered in the crisis room that evening. Reading time with Uncle Louis was a welcome diversion to the unsettling arguments that had soured the celebration ceremony. Bringing Sahir's medallions up to the room, Amy placed them on the medication table. Light from the setting sun reflected off the new gold heart, but the dark-haired patient wasn't looking. He was staring out the window in despair. With deep compassion, she asked, Are you okay? I can't see out of my right eye at all, he complained, turning his head to look at her with his left. 
But, he sighed, I guess I should be thankful that I can still see with the other. I'm so, so sorry, is it here? She replied sadly, not knowing what else to say. She longed to give him a hug, but held back. While it seemed that his painful relationship with Georgia might be falling apart, she wasn't quite sure it was over. Realizing that anything on his right side was not easily seen, Amy picked up the medals and walked in between the two patients. She began slipping each one onto the chain that still hung around his bedpost. You have a lot of medals here, she reminded him gently, pointing to each one of the three. You've been honored for kindness, courage, and selflessness in saving a life. These are all the most important ones. You have some really special treasures. The discouraged patient shook his head sadly and closed his eyes. Those aren't my treasures. They may be very kind gifts from the professor, but real treasures don't leave wounds around your neck. Uncle Louis looked over compassionately. Actually, sometimes they do, he encouraged. Sometimes the best treasures are only found through a great deal of pain and self-sacrifice. Keeping his eyes closed, the here frowned. I can't take any more pain, he said despondently. Tears began to flow and he angrily wiped his face. Now you're finally sounding like a normal guy, Ponzi joked. I thought I was the only one who couldn't handle pain. A slight smile hovered across the here's lips, but he didn't open his eyes. What if I lose sight of my other eye? He asked nervously. What if I can't see at all? Uncle Louis was quick to assure him that only the right side of his face had been affected by the heat. There's no reason to worry you'll lose sight in your other eye. Zaheer didn't seem at all comforted. He put his hands over his face. Appreciating Zaheer's distress, Uncle Louis chose to read what he thought would be most helpful. Tonight, I think we should launch right into Matthew, he suggested. We're so close to the end. Let's just finish this story. While Uncle Louis read about the last week of Jesus' life, Kenzie and Amy tended quietly to the wounded patients. Working closely together, they had established a little routine and knew what the other needed without a word. Kenzie measured the dosages and passed them to Amy, who took them to the patients. If she saw that a bottle of medication or formula was nearly empty, she would go to the hallway and bring in a new one. There were three separate doses for each burn victim and one for Uncle Louis. When all had been given out, they passed wipes and ointment back and forth as Kenzie worked on Ponzi's deepest wounds and Amy cared for his here. To anyone sitting back and observing the situation, the nurses had become a highly efficient team who worked well together. As he cleaned the wounds, Uncle Louis called their attention to one particular verse that he felt was pertinent to the distressing evening they had endured. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, he read, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Did you all hear that? Uncle Louis asked. Everyone nodded. This is servant leadership from the best example who has ever walked this earth, he told them. We lead best by serving. As he listened to the parables about the return of Jesus and his reaction to the preparedness of his servants, or lack thereof, both patients began to relax, and Zaheer's gloominess subsided. Some of the scab was breaking up around the edges of the wound as Amy cleaned her patient's arm, and she was surprised to see bright but very pink skin underneath. Maybe it's not completely healed, she pondered. When she was done, Amy took her usual seat on the sofa, Kenzie, however, took the chair in between. He rested his hand kindly on Zaheer's good arm. His dark-haired friend smiled up at him and relaxed against the pillow. You're ministering to the sick, he chuckled, repeating the words Uncle Louis had just read. May you enter into eternal life. Kenzie laughed. Thank you, he said warmly, patting Zaheer's arm. May we all. In a reflective tone, Uncle Louis mused over the reading he had just done. Whether this book is true or not, I really love God's Son, Jesus, he said. His teachings are easy to understand and so compassionate, and they just make good sense. Amy agreed. His rules aren't made on a whim that only serves half the people. Exactly, Uncle Louis chuckled. 
Zahir looked over at the older man by the window. Uncle Louis, he said kindly, I understand why you love Jesus. Just like you, he didn't sit back and demand that other people look after him. His life was about caring for others, healing them, feeding them, and teaching them helpful advice that would make their lives better. That is how you've led us. Uncle Louis smiled. Thanks, Sahir, he said warmly. I have tried to lead like this, but I never had such divine wisdom to pass along. With a chuckle, he contemplated his own life. Ironically, since the professor insisted that I learn and practice servant leadership, he taught me about Jesus Christ even before I knew his name. Now, with what we've learned, we have a much higher reason to serve those around us in the same way. Remember, good leadership isn't dominating other people by fear and forcing their cooperation. Good leadership involves service, listening to people, having empathy for their feelings, healing them with your words or actions, persuading them with logical arguments and real evidence, building up your community and showing the right way by how you act. Remember that. Example, not intimidation. Force and threats may bring compliance for a time, but it doesn't change hearts. Always desire to save lives, not destroy. And remember, the only one who can truly save any of us is Jesus Christ, through the way that his Father provided. So if we want to save lives and change hearts, we must lead everyone to the Son of God. There were nods all around. While they were all in agreement, some privately doubted their own abilities. A few miracles would be nice, Ponzi considered with a grin. Just think, if you were Jesus, you could heal our wounds instantly. So he agreed. Uncle Louie nodded. Well, the rest of this story goes far beyond servant leadership. Let's keep reading. While the sky grew dark and loons called out to each other on the peaceful lake, the solar lights cast a soft glow throughout the cozy room. A few fireflies flitted in and out of the open windows. Riveted to the terribly sad story in the last few chapters of Matthew, Amy hugged her legs on the pink sofa. Her eyes were fastened on Uncle Louis as he read the dramatic record. The religious leaders had become enraged with Jesus' popularity and his incredible healing powers from God, which they lacked. They were appalled at his words that openly contradicted centuries of their revered man-made traditions. Jealousy and anger brought them to a point where they were blind to their own ungodly behavior and failed to see the horrendous injustice of killing a man who had never sinned and who had compassionately healed the sick and wounded. They were terribly envious when Jesus claimed he spoke words that were directly from God. The rulers considered themselves to be God's chosen ones, yet God wasn't showing these wonderful powers through them. Instead of seeing their own error, they foolishly decided that Jesus must be an imposter. The four Tanis listened to the sad account, hearing that Jesus was increasingly distressed by the terrible plight God had warned him he was about to endure. And yet, after tearfully begging God to find another way, Jesus accepted God's plan for his life, saying, Not as I will, but as you will. With horror, the four Tanis listened as Uncle Louis read about the betrayal by a close friend. With vivid imaginations, they saw the kind healer forsaken by all his friends when he needed them most, tried unfairly in a court of law that should have protected him from such injustice, and then, when he stood bloody and wounded in front of hundreds of people whom he had compassionately helped, those very same people cried out for him to be put to death. Amy wiped away tears as she listened. She felt for the disciple Peter, who was greatly confused when Jesus gave himself up to be treated as a criminal, and losing faith, wasn't brave enough to admit his relationship with his very best friend. Denying he knew Jesus three times, Peter felt devastating grief when Jesus turned and looked his way. Amy well remembered what it had been like to receive a look of loving disappointment from Uncle Louis. The elder Tiny explained crucifixion to them all, filling their hearts with dread as they imagined the terrible pain of nails being driven through one's hands and feet and then all of one's weight hanging upon those wounds. But the story didn't end in despair. Smiles broke out on all their faces when Uncle Louis read the last chapter about Jesus' resurrection. Wide-eyed and happy, 
Amy imagined herself as one of the women heading out early in the morning to wrap Jesus' dead body with spices, only to discover that he wasn't in the empty tomb. Instead, an angel in shiny white clothes declared that Jesus was alive. She could imagine Mary's joy when she saw her Savior standing in front of her and fell down at his feet. Jesus had been restored to life and was the first to receive God's gift of immortality. A loud snore disturbed her vision. Ponzi had fallen asleep. I've read all four accounts of Jesus' life, Uncle Louis said, and each one has unique details that are interesting to piece together to give us a fuller picture. In the Gospel of John, one of the disciples doesn't believe Jesus is actually alive again until he sees the print of the nails in his hands and the scar on his side. Jesus still had wounds after he was raised, Amy frowned. Yes, Uncle Louis smiled, glancing quickly over at Zaheer. Giving his life for the whole world left Jesus a marked man. I'm sure God could have taken those marks away when he raised him up, but perhaps they were left to remind everyone of the price Jesus paid to give us salvation. If the gospel records are true, we only have this amazing hope because Jesus Christ was willing to give up his life for others. Pondering his words and relating them to the experiences they had all endured, Amy echoed, Jesus was willing to die for others. And so were you, Uncle Louis. You almost died trying to save Ponzi and Zaheer. Hesitantly, she turned to the dark-haired man with the long purple scars. And you, Zaheer, she said, swallowing hard. You almost died to save Ponzi. Glancing quickly in Ponzi's direction to ensure he was still asleep, Zaheer shook his head unhappily. In an anguish whisper, he protested, There is a big difference between what I did and what Jesus did. I ran to help Ponzi, not give up my life for him. Darkly, he murmured, I thought it would be a quick fix. I'd lift the burning beam off his back, drag him out, and be done. I had no idea I'd be burnt. His voice broke or how painful burns would be, or how much it would change everything. Or maybe I wouldn't have tried. Still sitting beside him, Kenzie squeezed his arm. You would have tried, Zaheer, even if you knew you would suffer. I know you. In the soft light, Amy could see the anguish come over Zaheer's face. I don't know that I would have, Kenzie. I don't know, he grieved. Don't think so highly of me. And then he began to sob. No, I would never have paid this price. Never. Amy couldn't bear to see Zaheer so distraught. Running over, she knelt down by his scarred arm and took his hand in both of hers. Zaheer sobbed and sobbed as though his heart would break, while his two friends on either side tried their best to comfort him. Ponzi woke up with all the noise and wanted to know what was going on. In a low voice, Uncle Louis tried to explain that Zaheer had been touched by the story they read. Having finally vented some of the deep personal distress he had been holding back, Zaheer apologized with embarrassment. I'm sorry, he said, choking on another sob. I can't believe I'm crying about silly scars and one blind eye. I, I shouldn't be so upset about this. I hate these thoughts. I should be thankful that we are all still alive. I should be thankful that I can still see. Fervently, he expressed, those are precious gifts that I still have. But then he broke down crying again. Kenzie patted his arm. I get it, he assured his friend lovingly. You paid a heavy price. With a heart full of compassion, Amy rested her face against the scarred arm. In a sleepy voice, Ponzi asked, Are you talking about the fire? Reaching over, Kenzie patted Ponzi's hand. Yes, he said. Don't worry, Ponzi. So here will be okay. I'm sorry, Zaheer, Ponzi begged. I'm sorry I ruined your life. Zaheer choked up again. No, no, Kenzie corrected. Don't say that, Ponzi. Zaheer's life is not ruined. But this is all my fault, Ponzi cried. I'm sorry, Zaheer, now your girlfriend is mad at you and you don't look the same and... Trying to console Zaheer and keep Ponzi from making things worse, Kenzie held the arms of both patients. Just remember, he interrupted, Zaheer is still the good man he's always been. Scars don't change who someone is on the inside. Amy longed to say something comforting, but everything that came to her mind she dismissed. She longed to say, I still love you, Zaheer. 
but that seemed too forward. To say, I still like you, wasn't nearly strong enough. She longed to say, I still think you're handsome, but again, she wasn't sure how that comment would be received. So instead, she just held his hand, kept her face against his arm, and was very thankful that Kenzie was carrying the conversation. Finally, Zaheer turned to look at Uncle Louie and murmured quietly, What I wanted to say before I lost it? Again, there was a catch in his voice, and he had to close his eyes for a second. Persevering, he choked out, This Jesus that you've read about knew everything ahead of time. He told his disciples that people would despise and reject him and put him to death, a death of torture, and and he willingly gave himself up. He chose to go through with it. I could never have gone in knowing what lay ahead. Amy shuddered. This is incredibly inspiring leadership, Zaheer, Uncle Louis agreed. I don't have that kind of courage either, but I know that Jesus is the leader that I want to follow. You both have way more courage than I do, Kenzie admitted. Or me, Amy added meekly, thankful to say something. And I love your honesty, Zaheer. The distressed patient squeezed her hand, but he spoke with despair. What? My honesty, that I'm not the courageous rescuer that you all hoped I was. Amy looked up past the dark eye that could no longer see, into the one that was filled with grief. No. I love your desire to be truthful, she clarified. Even if we might think less of you, that's what I love. Zaheer didn't answer, but he held her hand tightly. For a while, they all reflected on what they were learning and the strong pull it was having on their heart. Looking out into the black night, they heard the loons call out again and laughter down by the water. In a quiet voice, Zaheer added, It must have been so humiliating for Jesus to have hung on that cross, naked in front of those he loved, shamed, helpless, rejected, dying with thieves. But he knew in his mind that he had done the right thing, Uncle Louis encouraged. He knew he was suffering for the benefit of others. Jesus told his disciples there was no greater love than to lay down your life for another. Don't forget that, Sahir. If Jesus had thought of his own life first and turned down the opportunity to save the world, he would have escaped the physical pain, but he would have been filled with deep mental anguish for the rest of his life. Ponzi spoke up quietly. Do you wish you would let me die? No, of course not, Zaheer protested earnestly as the tears flooded down his face again. Don't ever say that. But isn't that what we're talking about, Ponzi argued. Are you sorry that you helped me and ended up a mess? Do you wish you'd listen to... Uncle Louie interrupted. Ponzi, what we're trying to do is relate to Jesus' sufferings. We're trying to empathize with his feelings when he gave his life for us, he explained. So for instance, Ponzi, how do you think Sahir would feel if you turned against him now after he saved your life? What? Ponzi protested earnestly. Why would I do that? I I would never do that. Still holding Zaheer's hand and sitting on the floor beside his bed, Amy looked over with a quizzical expression. She wondered why Uncle Louis was asking this question. Ponzi had been quietly supportive of Zaheer ever since the fire. Well, he often fell asleep when they were reading and mostly talked about the amazing adventure center he hoped to build in the forest. Ponzi didn't complain nearly so much about fairness. A gentle change had taken place, one that involved deep gratitude. I'm not saying that you would, Ponzi, Uncle Louis said kindly. In fact, I believe that you wouldn't. But in trying to appreciate Jesus' sacrifice, which was on a much greater scale than anything any of us will ever give, I'd like to consider our reaction to such great love. Ponzi nodded. So imagine, Uncle Louis explained, that after Zaheer endured so much pain to save you, you decided you wanted nothing to do with him. Maybe you might say that Zaheer hadn't helped you at all or that you could have rescued yourself from the fire. How do you think that would make Zaheer feel? But I wouldn't say that, Ponzi fretted. Zaheer would feel devastated, Kenzie piped up, still holding on to his friend's arm, and I'd feel devastated for him. He would feel like his sacrifice was all for nothing. Uncle Louie nodded. Exactly. Even if you were someone who really didn't mean to make such a painful sacrifice, you would feel very hurt if it wasn't appreciated. So think about Jesus. 
He willingly chose to suffer for us. He knew the torture and suffering he'd have to endure, and he did it anyway because he had compassion on us, sinners. So how will Jesus feel if we don't value his sacrifice or if we say that we don't need him or that we can look after ourselves? How will Jesus feel if we don't change our lives because of what he did? Amy understood the powerful point. She pleaded, what does Jesus want us to do, Uncle Louis? Uncle Louis looked over at the guys. Anyone have an answer? Kenzie pondered the matter. Well, Jesus talked a lot about repentance and forgiveness. Nodding, Uncle Louis agreed. So, if the Bible is true, then we've been called to stop living for ourselves and to ask for forgiveness. In other places, we are told that we need to commit our lives to Jesus in baptism. Do you think the Bible is true? Kenzie inquired. I'd like to do a little more investigation, Uncle Louis sighed. Looking over at Amy with a hopeful expression, she immediately understood what he meant. Uncle Louis wanted to get to the cave. Anxiously, she considered that it was a long way to walk up and down the hill, and lately he hadn't ventured any further than just around the house. She hoped he could get strong enough to go, and then she began to wonder what she could do to make such a trip possible. She could see how much he wanted to make one more trip. Chapter 33. A Poor Reaction Late the next evening, as Amy and Kenzie looked after their patient's wounds, Uncle Louis read a chapter from the professor's book. The purple scab was crumbling away on Zaheer's arm, exposing large new patches of bright pink skin below. It looked a little odd against his dark olive tone, and Amy was worried that he wasn't going to like the results. Looking up, she saw that Zaheer was gazing at his arm with a troubled expression. Kenzie was wiping Ponzi's leg. These scabs are coming off, he announced happily. How exciting is this? You guys will be back to your old selves soon and free to go home. Uncle Louie rolled over with a smile. I'm so pleased. This is great news, he said. Ponzi began asking exactly when he could leave the caring center, but Zaheer was silent. As she cleaned her patient's facial wound carefully with the sterile wipe, large sections of the softened scar tissue came free. The scabs are coming off your face as well, Amy smiled. Zaheer nodded wearily. Removing the dead skin, Amy applied the special ointment that the professor had sent in. The bright pink discoloration on her friend's dark olive skin face was very noticeable. Glancing quickly over to Ponzi, she noted that the pink skin on his arm blended in better with his reddish bronze tone. Under the scabs, the new skin was also distorted and wrinkled. The scar had badly marred Zaheer's appearance on the right side of his face, all the way from his beard to his hairline, and sadly, his blind eye had clouded over. Amy had always hoped that once the scabs came off, Zaheer would look the same again, but he didn't. Knowing he was going to be very upset with his appearance, tears of sympathy welled up in her eyes. "'What's wrong?' her patient asked anxiously. Nothing's wrong, she replied, forcing a smile. You have a nice pink glow. It's healing well. I'd like to look at myself, Sahir said suddenly. I want to see for myself. Feeling nervous about Sahir's response to his appearance, Amy didn't meet his gaze. Sure, she said, stopping the treatment. Getting up, Sahir walked into the little room with the sink, the hard chair, and a mirror. Amy looked over at Uncle Louis and Kenzie with trepidation. The older man closed his eyes and sighed deeply. They all waited breathlessly, but they didn't hear any reaction. A whole minute went by. Amy nervously twisted her hands together. She looked up at Kenzie again. Do you think Zaheer's okay? he whispered. Amy stood up and walked into the small room. Zaheer was standing at the sink with his head down. Tears were falling from his eyes. Drawing close, she embraced his arm with deep sympathy. It's okay, she said kindly, unable to stop her own tears. You're still you. No, it's not okay, he protested angrily, pulling away. I look horrific. 
My face is a mess. I don't even recognize myself. This is not me. No wonder you're crying. How can you say it's okay? You're not being honest with me, Amy. You're not. Never had Amy seen Zaheer so angry. Just, just leave me alone, he begged, sobbing. Pulling further away, he covered his face with his hands. I'm sorry, Amy. Please go. Just please go. For the first time ever, the copper-haired nurse felt that she had failed to hear. He had never told her to go away before. Had she done a lousy job healing his burns? Was she a bad nurse? Returning to the room, she couldn't hide that she was crying. Uncle Louis looked up with compassion, and Kenzie came over and gave her a quick hug. Even Ponzi looked up sadly. Don't worry, Amy. Uncle Louis said softly. He's just in shock. Give him time. He'll get over this. Unable to speak, Amy nodded and bolted from the room. Twilight was settling in as Amy ran out of the house and into the forest. A tree fell close by as she headed straight to the control cave, but she didn't turn to look. Pulling out her key, she unlocked the door and turned on the light. She barely remembered to close the door behind her. Then she went over to the phone and turned it on. With tears streaming down her face, she messaged the professor. The scabs are coming off, she wrote, wiping her eyes frequently. And Zaheer's skin looks very pink underneath. It's wrinkled and stands out and looks quite different than it did before. His blind eyes turn cloudy. Zaheer looked at himself in the mirror and was very upset, even angry. Did I do a bad job looking after him? Did I do something wrong? With her heart breaking, Amy added several very sad emojis to her message. She sent the text. While she waited for a reply, she decided to investigate burns. Okay, Google, she said, and the screen immediately lit up. Burn victim, she said. Several articles and pictures came up on the screen. She scrolled through them. It was reassuring for her to see that many people had scars after major burns, and some were far worse than Zaheer's. She read articles about treatment and realized that unless skin grafts were done, most burn victims ended up with very visible scars. Googling skin grafts, she quickly understood that such an operation required abilities way beyond basic nursing care. Music sounded from the tall, thin black box, and Amy realized the professor was video calling her. Accepting the call, she was happy to see his face. Are you okay, Amy? he asked. Bursting into tears, she explained what had happened when Zaheer had looked in the mirror. I'm so proud of the way you have looked after Zaheer in Ponzi, Zach praised with a catch in his voice. Had you not followed the instructions carefully, they might not be alive today. You kept them from dangerous infection, and, and they have healed so well. Thank you, she said wiping her face with her hand. There will be scarring, Jacks informed her. Unfortunately, scarring is a sad but very normal consequence of burns. The ointment you are using may diminish the scarring a little over time, but it won't go away. The best nurse in my world could not stop Sahir from scarring, and likely no one could have saved his eye. You did well, Amy, he praised. It will be hard at first for him to accept that this is his new appearance. Once he realizes that all his friends still love him, regardless of his looks, he will stop feeling so upset. Give him time and lots and lots of understanding. The professor asked if she had investigated Burns online, and Amy told him she had seen images. Well, look up the emotional impact of Burns, he suggested, and you will see that there is often a lot more to the healing process than just the physical wounds. Zaheer and Ponzi will go through emotional challenges as they re-enter normal life. It may not be so hard on Ponzi as his wounds aren't across his face, but they both will need friends to reassure them again and again until they adjust. It may take some time and patience, Amy. This may be the most challenging part. I'll look into it, she promised. Do you feel up to this? he asked kindly. Do you feel you have enough support? Uncle Louis has been so helpful, Amy nodded. I'm so thankful he's with us. And Kenzie is Zahira's best friend. She told him about the tearful outburst the night before and how well Kenzie had handled the situation. So, Zahir was upset because he regrets helping Ponzi, the professor clarified. Amy nodded. Poor Zahir, Jax empathized. This is all hitting him hard. I can understand his feelings. Odin or Fran should have helped. They were the ones who started that fire. Ponzi was their buddy. We had a good discussion about it, 
Amy began tentatively. We were reading that Jesus gave his life for the world, and God left the scars on him so that everyone would remember what he did. Nodding politely, the professor wasn't sure what to say. Sahir started crying, Amy relayed, because he said that if he knew all the pain he'd have to go through, then maybe he wouldn't have rushed into the fire. He was amazed that Jesus knew exactly what he had to endure, and he still chose to give up his life to save others. Interesting, the professor responded flatly, not wanting to enter a religious discussion with his beloved daughter, not when she had so much to deal with already. Well, just call on me if you need any more help, he smiled. Sometimes challenges like this are very hard for the caregiver, not just the patient. You may need to talk it through frequently. Tears welled up in Amy's eyes. I love you, Amy, he said tenderly. You were doing everything I hoped you would as a nurse. Just persevere, darling. Everything will get better in time. Darling? It's just a kind name for someone you love. Amy had not realized there were kind names as well as hurtful ones. She liked darling. Should I call you father, she asked. I would love to hear you say that, he smiled. And dad would be even better. Smiling, she tried it out. Good night, dad, she said. Good night, my darling, he smiled. Hang in there. The kind name was almost like getting a hug. When they had disconnected, she sat happily for a moment, contemplating the amazing privilege of having a real father. Then she took his advice and read an article on the emotional impact of burns. After a few paragraphs, she realized that all the mental turmoil Sahir was struggling with was a natural part of the healing process. One article concluded by saying that the emotional impact could be greatly lessened by the presence of loving and supportive friends and family. It's going to take time, she told herself. But one day Zaheer will laugh and sing again. Right now, I want to be one of his loving and supportive friends. I will try my best to lift him up, just like he did for me. There were muffled sounds outside the cave door. She heard Lily's voice. She hasn't come to bed yet. I think Amy's still in there. And the light is on, Franz whispered. No fair, Odin replied, adding in several strange words that he said in a rude manner. This is our time. She can't take it all. Shh, Lily said. She'll hear you. I am in here, Amy called out loudly, and I do hear you, and I'm doing an important investigation. None of you are supposed to be here. Some muffled laughter rang out, and there were scurrying noises as the three tinies ran off. Oh no, Amy thought. They have been coming in here. This is why Lily gets up in the middle of the night. She must be taking my key when I'm sleeping. But they can't get in without it. They won't get in again. Before she left, she wrote another message to the professor, telling him what she'd overheard, confessing her foolish decision to put their key under a rock, and promising that from now on she would always keep it around her neck. Chapter 34. Speak up. From the phone, Amy knew it was past midnight when she made her way back up to the caring center. She showered in the room beside the outhouse and walked up the stone stairs on Rainbow Hill. The wind was blowing strong, and she glanced from side to side nervously, hoping that the trees wouldn't topple over on her. She was very surprised to meet Kenzie near the clearing. Sitting on the top stair in the dim moonlight, his face was lined with worry. Amy, where have you been? he asked anxiously. You stayed away a long time. Just in case anyone else was listening, she replied in a hushed tone, I've been talking to the professor. I've been in the cave. He nodded. That's what Uncle Louis thought, he said. But then he chided, Amy, you shouldn't have run off. You have no idea how badly Zaheer feels. Swelling hard, Amy bit her lip. I'm sorry, she said. I was really hurt. I needed time to think. I needed to talk things over with someone. Standing up, Kenzie put his hand on her shoulder. You can talk to me, Amy, he pleaded. 
And sometimes I might need to talk to you as well. This is hard on both of us. She nodded sadly. I think we've done our best to heal the burns, Kenzie continued emotively. But I feel for Zaheer inside, inside his mind. I can't imagine looking in the mirror and not recognizing myself. He used to see a reflection that any guy would be proud of, and now he sees a face that he doesn't want to claim. It must be really hard to have done the right thing and then be damaged for the rest of your life. It must be devastating when the girl you once thought loved you tells you that you stink and is repulsed by your looks and rarely comes to see how you're doing. Instead, she's hanging out with a guy who... Kenzie ended his lengthy outburst mid-sentence. Amy nodded sadly as the wind blew the loose strands of her hair around. She knew there were other things that Kenzie could add, and it was unusual for him to speak so passionately. It must be so hard, she agreed. I learned a lot tonight. Apparently, Zaheer's scars are normal. We, we didn't do anything wrong, Kenzie. And it's also very normal for people with major burns to go through a lot of negative emotions and tears as they heal. It may go on for weeks. Really? Her friend replied, thinking through the new information thoughtfully. So this is normal, he considered with relief. I think it will help all of us to know that, Zaheer included. Remembering the professor's words to her, Amy added, and also, dealing with the patient's emotions can be really hard on the caregivers. Yeah, it is, Kenzie agreed. It hurts to see my friend so down. I don't always know what to say. With a deep sigh, the curly-haired nurse pondered how they could help. Looking at Amy again, he said, So then, we need to help him get his confidence back. I'd say he comes first right now. Not our feelings. Not anyone else's feelings. Amy looked up. What do you mean, she asked. You can't take off like that when your feelings get hurt, he chided a little harshly. He's going to say things he doesn't mean. So here is trying to deal with thoughts he doesn't understand, and he hasn't worked through. We need to stay balanced for him. I'm sorry, she said. I'll try harder. With a probing expression, Kenzie asked, Are you still worried about Georgia? Bowing her head, Amy admitted, Yes, I definitely don't want to upset her again. And where has Georgia been lately? Has she been caring for him? Amy shook her head slowly. Shifting uncomfortably, Kenzie sighed. Amy, if you really care about Zaheer, this might be a good time to tell him. There's no rule, Amy. He hasn't made promises to anyone, and Georgia has demoralized him. With a smile, he said, I'd say you should stop hiding your feelings. I can see them, but Zaheer can't. Don't tell him anything that isn't true, he cautioned. Kind words that aren't real just hurt worse in the end. But if you have something true to say, then speak up. With everyone in the room? she asked anxiously. With a laugh, Kenzie looked relieved and gave her a quick hug. Of course, we'll be cheering for you, he smiled. Come on, let's get some sleep before the morning comes. Following her friend into the mansion and up the stairs, Amy could hear Uncle Louie reading, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. In the softly lit room, Uncle Louis was on his side, reading from the Bible, while Zaheer was sitting up in bed, his head and arms resting on his knees. Ponzi had been asleep, but his eyes fluttered open when Amy walked in. Kenzie stood in the doorway. The lady in white is back, Ponzi mumbled wearily. Amy walked around the bed to the chair between the patients. She was relieved to see a calm, serene look on Zaheer's face. It was a very different expression from the one she had left. Whatever Uncle Louis had been reading has soothed his troubled spirit. Hesitantly, she reached for his hand and sat down beside him. I'm sorry, Amy, he said. You aren't mad at me anymore, she implored. I was never mad at you, he replied earnestly, squeezing her hand. I was mad at life, at circumstances, but certainly not with you. The kind smile, he added, 
if I ever say go away again, which hopefully I never will, it only means I need a few minutes to pull myself together. I don't like to be seen with floods of tears coming down my face. I'm sorry. Please don't take it personally. For a moment, Amy considered giving him a hug. She sensed it would be received well. Ponzi was looking over curiously, and Uncle Louie and Kenzie were close by. Then Ponzi winked. Amy stood up. The atmosphere just wasn't quite right. Okay, just a few minutes next time, she nodded, laughing. Turning to head to Lily's room, she said, Good night, everyone. You've been the very best nurse that I could ask for, Zaheer added. Looking back at him, many things went through Amy's mind that she yearned to tell her patient. However, even with Kenzie's recent encouragement, it wasn't easy to give vent to long repressed feelings while three sets of eyes looked on. With a teasing smile in Ponzi's direction, Amy praised, Tears are better than hollers, any time. Hey, Ponzi jested, but at least I get it all out. Zaheer tries to keep the lid on everything, but it's just going to burst through one way or another. Zaheer had to laugh. There was a lot of truth to Ponzi's bantering. Amy said a second good night and headed off to Lily's room. Chapter 35. Words. Ah, that sun is lovely, Uncle Louis sighed the next morning, breathing in the fresh air that was flowing through the room. With the eyedropper in his hand, Kenzie squeezed out the older Chinese portion of formula, and Amy took it to him. I think we should all get outside today, the copper-haired nurse smiled, handing her elder brother his cup. Bringing over the wipes and the ointment, Kenzie set them down on Zaheer's bed for Amy and began to clean Ponzi's wounds. The scabs were still coming off. As the two nurses worked on their patients, Uncle Louis told them what he could see out the window. Deer were nibbling the grass. Lorikeys were chatting noisily in the big tree nearby. Squirrels were jumping from one branch to another. And two more trees had come down in the middle of the night. Uncle Louis had even heard them fall. On her way to make breakfast, Georgia popped in to say good morning. Her apologies to one particular patient tumbled out anxiously. I'm I'm sorry for what I said yesterday. I, I shouldn't have been so upset about the song. Suddenly noticing the discoloration on Zaheer's face, she looked over at Amy with a frown. Why is Zaheer turning pink? She asked. Have you been following all the instructions carefully? Very carefully, Zaheer replied. Resisting the urge to lash out, Amy kept her voice even. He's actually healing well, and so is Ponzi, she smiled. It's quite normal for burn victims to have scarring. With resignation, Sahir looked down at his arm and sighed. Pink's my new color. I'm just thankful to be alive. He's had an excellent nurse, Uncle Louie informed Georgia. The scarring isn't Amy's fault. Well, I still love you, Sahir. Georgia reassured him. Forcing herself to smile at Amy, Georgia added, And you have been a good nurse. I don't know how you put up with all that mess and smell. I sure couldn't. Kenzie's remarks in the early hours of the morning echoed in her mind as Amy's face flushed red. Zaheer was looking down and she couldn't read his expression, but she knew the words must hurt. Will I always have those scars? Georgia questioned watching Amy take some ointment from the round container and rub it on his pink, wrinkled skin. Or will that stuff you're putting on him make them go away? Amy swallowed hard. The fence of anger flowed through and gave her the courage she needed. Her voice wavered, but she spoke up for the young man who already had been through so much. You know, when I see these scars, she said to Georgia, I remember the courage Zaheer had to save Ponzi's life even though he put himself in danger. Tears welled up in her eyes as she turned to her patient. I'm so proud of your scars, Sahir. I hope they never go away. Me too, Uncle Louis added. Ponzi and Kenzie agreed. Sahir sighed deeply. 
He looked up at Amy with sincere appreciation, and then his eyes flooded over. Georgia tossed back her long blonde hair. Her green eyes glittered angrily at the copper-haired nurse. I might not be in to read today, she told Zaheer in a rather miffed tone. Surfing lessons are on the big waves this afternoon. I'm so nervous and excited. But I do love you, she proclaimed earnestly. Amy missed the look of disdain that was directed her way, since she was handing her patient a dry cloth to wipe his face. Looking out the window as he hastily wiped his eyes, Zaheer nodded, but he didn't reply. Georgia repeated her words of affection louder. Georgia, Zaheer pleaded quietly. I don't want to hear any more meaningless words. If you don't mean it, don't say it. Of course I mean it, the blonde argued. Struggling to stop his streams of tears, the dark-haired patient spoke gently. I don't want to hurt your feelings, Georgia this is not working for either of us. I'm not interested in half-hearted relationships, and I, I know you won't be either. Turning his head to look up at the blonde beauty, he begged, please don't say those words to me again. It hurts more than it helps. In a huff, Georgia whirled around and fled down the stairs. So here clamped the cloth firmly over his eyes and held it in place. Kenzie looked over and smiled. Hope filled Amy's heart. Uncle Louie cleared his throat and began talking about how much he would love to eat an apple. And a bouquet of flowers would be lovely as well, he added. I haven't seen flowers for so long. I wonder if the sunflowers are ready for picking. Rubbing the anti-itch cream into Zaheer's arm, Amy looked over at Uncle Louie with a smile. I'll go to the store when I'm done, she promised happily. I'll bring back some apples for everyone. And yes, let's get outside today, she added. Once the scars were attended to and the medications given out, Kenzie led the three patients through their morning stretch and exercise program, while Amy cleaned up the old bandages. As usual, one trip up and down Randall Hill to the outhouse and shower finished the session off for the two young men. Amy took a break to walk over to the store, talk to some of the other tinies, and pick up apples and flowers. Fahid and Charlie were dragging dead trees over to the farmland. They had already collected 21, and a pile of sawed-off branches lay nearby. A loud discussion was taking place in the store as Amy walked in. Just try it, Odin was saying, holding a plump, pale carcass by its two legs. But that's disgusting, Nancy pleaded, as Milan tried to keep his eager dog from investigating the new aroma. Look, it, it's bleeding. I can't put a dead chicken in the oven. We use the oven for food, not dead things. You fry dead fish in a pan, Franz argued. What's the difference? Nancy tried to argue that they fried fish fillets in a pan, but she stopped mid-sentence, seeing the point. Damien walked in with the farmers. Fahid noticed the dead bird immediately. Where did you get that chicken? He inquired with alarm. It paid a visit to the fun forest, Odin chuckled. Franz has a good shot. My first try with the new bow and arrow, Franz boasted. On something living, that is. You killed one of our chickens? The heat exclaimed in disbelief. What happened to all its feathers? Charlie cried out, horrified. You don't eat the feathers, Odin smirked. It's the meaty part that tastes so good. How would you know, the heat shouted. Don't you dare touch another one of our pets. Or what? Odin asked, bemused. Not having an adequate response, Fahid looked over for help from his farmer friends. Or you'll answer to us, Charlie replied, motioning to himself and Fahid, both of us, and likely Kenzie too. And me, Damien piped up, crossing his arms and standing tall. Look here, you rolling tumbler, he said, using his derogatory term for Odin. Touch those chickens again and you'll have a ride out in the lake that you'll never forget. Pretending to be frightened, Odin said, Oh, I'm so scared. And what about Franz? Will you dump him in the water too? I'm sure he's really worried about swimming. Lima piped up. Touch those chickens again, and we'll give you some first-hand wave education. You'll find out what a real rolling tumbler is. Odin didn't reply. For a brief second, he looked fearful. Then he said, Remember... We have bows and arrows. We killed a chicken. Damien's eyes narrowed. Are you threatening us? 
You threaten me first, Odin scoffed, even though Uncle Louis told you to stop it. You're asking for trouble, Damien told him. You might get it sooner than you think. If no one else is going to do anything to stop you from causing harm, then I will. He glared at Franz. The wiry young man was much smaller, but they had been friends for a long time. Don't touch the chickens, he said flatly. Franz tossed back his stringy hair. One was fun, he said proudly. There are lots of other things we can practice on. Rusty lunged forward again, finding it hard to resist, the fresh, bare meat dangling from Odin's hand. Lynn grabbed his dog around the chest and spoke to him sharply. Then, looking up at Odin, he declared, We aren't cooking the chicken here. Chickens are pets in paradise, and they don't belong to either of you. Take it away and make sure the dogs don't get it. You need to bury it deep, Charlie called out, or we will. Using words that sounded crude and mean, Odin complained that burying the chicken was a terrible waste. The other Chinese looked at him blankly, confused by his language. Damien frowned. I don't know what you're saying. You talk strange. In a rage, Odin threw the chicken on the floor. He turned around and stomped off. Rusty lunged forward eagerly, pulling Milan along the floor. Quickly, Charlie picked up the dead carcass. I'll bury it, he said. Fahid shook his head in dismay. We'd better build higher walls with all those dead trees so the chickens can't get out. I didn't realize their lives were in danger. Lima and Damien left. Amy talked to Nancy and Milan for a while, finding out what supplies were needed. She returned to the mansion with flowers, apples, and the worrisome tail of a dead, naked chicken. Her patients were outside in the shade under the veranda, learning how to play cards with Lily, Santa, and Lima. Uncle Louis was sitting on the bench swing. The apples were gratefully accepted by everyone. The story concerned them all, except for Ponzi, who found it so hilarious that he couldn't stop laughing. You need to get better, Uncle Louis, Amy pleaded. Damien is still threatening to take Odin out into the water. What if he actually drowns him? And Odin is saying strange words and threatening to use weapons. They'll listen to you, Uncle Louis, but they'll never listen to anyone else. Zaheer so looked up anxiously as he laid down a jack of spades. Santa groaned and decided to pick up the card. He won't really drown him, Lima piped up. I won't let him. But he may give Odin a good scare, and that's what Odin needs. Uncle Louis spoke. Remember, you can only set an example, listen, empathize, educate, and speak in a persuasive way. We can't force anyone to comply, and we won't win everyone over. And we certainly cannot take the life of another. The professor will ensure that things don't get out of hand. Lima didn't seem convinced, but Santa was giving him a look that had a restraining effect. Coming outside with the chess set and seeing that everyone else was occupied with their card game, Kenzie asked Amy if she wanted to learn how to play. Neither of them had tried it before, but following the instructions in the box, they had fun figuring it out. Later that afternoon, when they were back up in the crisis room getting their medications, which had nearly run out, Zaheer asked Uncle Louis, Can you please read more to us? From God's book, preferably, he smiled. Would you like to hear another story? A story sounds great, Ponzi chimed in, relaxing on his bed. Uncle Louis began reading in Exodus about a terrible time in Israel's history when they were enslaved in Egypt. While the two nurses went through their well-established routine, a fresh breeze blew through the room and little rainbows danced all over the walls. Uncle Louis basked in the warm sunshine near the big window. Even Ponzi was enthralled to hear about baby Moses being rescued by the Egyptian princess and brought up to live in the palace. Eventually, he slumbered off to sleep while Zaheer fought valiantly to keep his eyes open. Healing was still taking a toll, even though it was nearly complete. Almost three weeks had passed since the fire. As she gathered the used wipes and bandages into a pot, Uncle Louis stopped reading. Amy, he said quietly. Amy looked up. Kenzie walked into the room with another pot to collect used supplies. Sahir's eyes fluttered open. With a laugh, Uncle Louis said, Okay, this is for all three of you, then. He smiled. If you're feeling anxious about how paradise will run without me, I believe this book may be the key to making everything a lot easier. How? Zaheer asked anxiously. 
Kenzie and Amy stood still to listen. Well, if it's true, Uncle Louis prefaced, then this book provides the impetus to self-governance for everyone. If God is our creator, and so powerful that he can bring universes into being, then he is an authority far higher and mightier than anyone here in paradise. You won't have to go through heated debates, trying to determine right from wrong. God has already laid it out for us. When we believe that we have a creator who is watching over all, not just when we are visible outside our houses, but who even knows the thoughts that pass through our minds, this will be a powerful motivator for everyone to live right and think right. It will help stop wrong actions before they even get started. But how can we convince the others that they need to care about God? Zahira asked. Thinking it through, Uncle Louis answered, Only by sharing the message, just like I've shared it with you. Just think, if everyone chooses to follow Jesus' example, paradise could be an even better place than it has been in the past. The Bible is full of encouragement to treat each other kindly and to put others before ourselves. The three tinies liked his vision. He sighed. However, we still need to fully determine if the Bible is true, and you may have to do this without me. But if it's true, then the key to helping your world be the best it can be is to share this hope with everyone and live by this example. Thank you.